Well, unfortunately, I had to scrap my Valentine's Day sermon from the Song of Songs. And instead, I'm going back to Isaiah. But I am changing things up a little bit from what's in the bulletin. I'm only going from 15 to 19 this morning. Um, I would like to handle 20 and 21 separately and maybe attach it to what's coming up in chapter 60. So this morning, no Valentine's Day sermon this year, in Isaiah 59, I'm going to start in verse 15, though in my notes it says 15b, where the division is. This is the word of the Lord. Truth is lacking, and he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. The Lord saw it, and it displeased him, that there was no justice. He saw that there was no man, and wondered that there was no one to intercede. Then his own arm brought him salvation, and his righteousness upheld him. He put on righteousness as a breastplate, and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on garments of vengeance for clothing, and wrapped himself in zeal as a cloak. According to their deeds, so will he repay wrath to his adversaries, repayment to his enemies. To the coastlands, he will render repayment. So they shall fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. For he will come like a rushing stream, which the wind of the Lord drives. May the Lord bless this reading of his word. If, as I have contended, oh, I don't know, 1,267 times to date, that the Old Testament is primarily a story, that it is an overarching narrative that gives meaning to those things which serve the narrative. So we read the law in light of the narrative. We read the poetry in light of the narrative. We, we, we read the wisdom, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, in light of the narrative. And so if the Old Testament is a story, then it must have a protagonist, or for our purposes this morning, a hero. Now, it certainly has heroes, but above all the heroes, all of whom fail in one way or another, there is the hero of heroes, and that is Yahweh himself, the God of Israel. He is the living and the true God. He is the one we call God, though we know him now through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so as I was reading this passage, I decided I wanted to return to an analogy that I used much earlier in the Isaiah series, because um, I think it's, it's helpful not only to understand the passage, but it's helpful as a way to help you read Isaiah well. And that is, that there are, broadly speaking, two types of people who read, study, and explain Holy Scripture. And these two types of people should be, I mean, they are naturally, but it doesn't always work that way, so they should be allies. The first we will call the scientist. And the scientist represents the theologian, the, maybe the systematic theologian who likes to work with categories and sort of summarizes biblical teaching under various categories. 
he or she is in search of the facts. The facts about God. The facts about salvation. The facts about sin. The facts about Christ's person and work. The facts about human nature and fallenness and so forth. And once he has certain a uh, certain number of scriptures organized together he can explain in factual form what the bible teaches about these various categories and so by analogy and this has nothing to do with john carey whatsoever he or she is is found under the the hood of the sports car he's the one who's studying the engine's horsepower and its rpms the scientist is the one who's after the physics the speed of a car's acceleration the way the car holds the road when it enters a curve even at higher speeds this person says things like torque and aerodynamics and knows what struts are and has some idea of what octane means. And then there's the artist. The artist, in the analogy, represents the exegete, that is, the interpreter of texts. And the exegete, the artist, is in search of things like genre. Are we reading poetry? Are we reading law? Are we reading narrative, wisdom, gospel, letters, apocalyptic, right? This person wants to know what words mean in specific contexts. He or she is after things like syntax and grammar and historical background. And in the analogy that has nothing to do with John Kerry, he or she loves the car's lines, its symmetry, the leather seats, its color, or maybe its colors. That person may not know physics or torque, but he knows the satisfying feeling of going through gears like a hot knife through butter either accelerating or deaccelerating and downshifting this person feels a car hold the road in a tight curve or the acceleration that it has in a straightaway so which one of the two is right the car designer or the car driver the scientist or the artist which one is superior to the other? Or should we think of them as two parts of a whole? So the scientist might come to our text this morning and point out that God's sovereignty in salvation is God's response to human depravity or sinfulness as it was described in say, I don't know, well, the whole chapter up and through verse 15b, where he who departs from evil puts a target on its own back because the nation is so corrupt. He sees this as agreement with Isaiah as a whole. Human inability requires God's sovereign initiative in salvation. But the artist comes to the text and sees, and sees a God who, let's see, a God who, who just can't stand it any longer. A God who loves his people and feels forced to act for them because it's so clear that they can't help themselves. Ask a scientist, what is God? And the answer might be something like, God is a spirit, 
infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. Ask the artist, what is God? And the answer is likely to be something like, well, he is our shepherd. He is a great king over us. He is our father. And our father made the world and everything that is in it. He is our husband, and we are his bride. He is our savior. And from Isaiah 59, the artist might say, he's a soldier. God is a soldier, or better, a warrior. So who is right? Well, of course, they both are. And the very best scientists and the very best artists know that they both are, and that really they depend on each other to be the best scientists that they can be and the best, best artists that they can be. But when we come to a passage like Isaiah 59, I would say here the artist has to take the lead. Because his teaching here from Isaiah is that Yahweh is a soldier. He is a warrior who, when he can stand it no longer, comes and fights for us. And so that's my first point this morning, that Yahweh is the warrior God. Yahweh is the warrior God. The Lord saw it and it displeased him that there was no justice. He saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no one to intercede. So what did he do? Then his own arm brought him salvation and his righteousness upheld him. He put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head and put on garments of vengeance and wrapped himself in zeal as a cloak. Yahweh, the warrior God. As we've seen over and over again in the prophets, Israel's fundamental problem is their idolatrousness. They are idolatrous as a nation, which means that they do not know God. They are in a covenant relationship with him, but they do not know their own God. So God's end, God's purpose for their redemption is that they know him. And we saw that early on, Isaiah chapter 1, verses 2 through 3. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for Yahweh has spoken. Children have I reared and brought up. But they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner, and the donkey its master's crib. But Israel does not know, and my people do not understand. So way at the other end of God's work to save his people for himself, we hear, Isaiah 52, 4 through 7, For thus says the Lord God, my people went down at the first into Egypt to sojourn there, and the Assyrian oppressed them for nothing. Now, therefore, what have I here, declares Yahweh, seeing that my people are taken away for nothing? Their rulers wail, declares Yahweh, and continually all the day my name is despised. <clears throat> Therefore, my people shall know my name. Therefore, in that day they shall know that it is I who speak. Here I am. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. You turn over one chapter to Isaiah 60, um, verse 15. Whereas you have been forsaken and hated with no one passing through, 
I will make you majestic forever, a joy from age to age. You shall suck the milk of nations, you shall nurse at the breast of kings, and you shall know that I, the Lord, am your Savior and your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. So, an essential part of knowing God aright is knowing him as he's revealed himself in Isaiah 59, as a warrior who takes up his people's cause, enters into battle against their enemies, and fights for them. And so on the one hand, it is vital to the church's welfare to know that, in fact, I'm going to stress that word, to know that, God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in his being. But those are concepts that by themselves aren't easy to grasp. And many of them are formulated from the scriptures, but also in opposition to critics and heretics. But those concepts originally came from texts like ours which connects us with the story as it's been told so far, and then, just as important, they connect to our imaginations and to our hearts in a very personal and very human way. So truth is lacking, and he who departs from evil makes himself a prey closes off the section in Isaiah 59 where the people express how helpless and hopeless they are in sin, capital S, sin. And they realize there is no way out for us. The situation on the ground is so bleak that if a man shows signs of repentance, the people single him out and put a target on his back and say, we need to go after him because he's showing signs of returning to the Lord. This is a nightmare scenario. There is an invisible enemy inside the nation. This is no longer about Babylonians over here and Philistines over there and Edomites over here. This is about something that, is, that has corrupted the people from the inside out. And so the text says, Yahweh saw it. He saw that. And here we have to ask the scientist to hold off for a minute. Maybe the scientist doesn't want to hear that Yahweh had to wonder. He saw that there was no man and wondered. He's kind of baffled at the situation. He's astonished is actually another way to translate the word. The scientist wants to step forward and actually some of the People I interact with do this. Well, we know, that, of course, that Yahweh knows what's going on. But uh, don't kill the moment. The artist says, no, let him finish. Let Isaiah say what I, Isaiah wants to say. Let's just let God be appalled for a moment as he surveys the situation, as he wonders to himself what to do under these oppressive conditions. Let, let Isaiah finish painting his picture. And it's as if Yahweh said, if there's no one who can save them, if this is just going to go on and on and on forever, I guess I'll have to do it myself. Gabriel, fetch my armor and saddle my horse. The time for talking is over. I'm going in. It's my turn. There isn't anybody on the ground who can deal with the situation as it is. It's up to me. 
This is the kind of thing that should stir our blood a little bit. Yahweh, the warrior God who is coming to fight. The imagery there, it's stirring. And it reminds us of better days in our story. When Yahweh first put on armor to engage the enemy, Exodus 6, 5 through 6, speaking to Moses, I have heard the groaning of the people of Israel, whom the Egyptians hold as slaves, and I have remembered my covenant. Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am Yahweh, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm. Same word here as his own arm brought him salvation. I will deliver them with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. And this is how the Exodus unfolds. Exodus 14, 24 through 25. And in the morning watch, Yahweh, in the pillar of fire and of cloud, looked down on the Egyptian forces and threw the Egyptian forces into a panic clogging their chariot wheels so that they drove heavily. And the Egyptians said, let us flee before Israel, for Yahweh fights for them. He fights for them against the Egyptians. They've got a soldier on their side of this conflict that we can't possibly fight against. Let's get out of here. And then, of course, Exodus 15, the songs that our ancestors sang at the sea once they've crossed over, 1 through 3. Then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to Yahweh, saying, I will sing to Yahweh, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and the rider he has thrown into the sea. Yahweh is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. Yahweh is a man of war. Yahweh is his name. And drop down to verse 16. Terror and dread fall upon them because of the greatness of your arm. His own arm brought him salvation. See, there's a poetic connection to our own story here that just the word arm and salvation bring to mind. They are as still as a stone till your people, Yahweh, pass by to the people pass by whom you have purchased. This is inspiring stuff. It invites, it invites our sanctified imaginations to do what God created our imaginations to do so that, so that our emotions are actually moved in ways that draw us into the story, not as scientists, but as warm-blooded people who love the leather seats and the way you can shift with such smoothness up or down and take curves at high speeds. That's why we go to the movies. That's why we used to read books, but now we tend to go to the movies. It's one of those moments that the hair stand up on the back of your neck or you get chills. It's an anonymous gladiator standing in the Colosseum before the emperor himself. And to identify himself, he removes his helmet and he says, My name is Maximus Decimus Meridius commander of the armies of the north, and the music is swelling up behind him, general of the Felix legions, loyal servant to the true emperor, he's facing the, the emperor now, eye to eye, loyal to the true emperor, Marcus Aurelius, father to a murdered son, husband to a murdered wife, and I will have my vengeance in this life or the next. Yahweh will have his vengeance. Just as at the sea, there is a salvation for his people. He is arming himself for it. But as always with salvation, there is the flip side, which is judgment. 
And that's my second point this morning. Yahweh is the holy warrior. The holy warrior. According to their deeds, so will he repay. Wrath to his adversaries, repayment to his enemies. To the coastlands he will re render repayment. So they shall fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. For he will come like a rushing stream, which the wind of the Lord drives. Look at his cause. That even those who repent mark themselves out as a prey from the majority. Look at his military apparel, righteousness as a breastplate, a helmet of salvation on his head. You know that not only is he coming to save his people, but according to their deeds, so he will repay. Wrath to his adversaries, repayment to his enemies. What is good news to the godly, to those who depart from evil and find themselves uh, ashamed by the majority, is a message of doom to the ungodly. There's another possible way of reading this, depending on how we read verse 19. I think both ways complement each other, even if we can't nail one down over the other. But because of the universal tone in verse 19, this may be a universal judgment, at which time the godly who lived throughout the whole world, and now the godly can live throughout the whole world because of the servant's work to bring his covenant and his law to the ends of the earth, they're going to find their long-sought relief from the wicked who hold power and abuse them. But whichever one is right, it puts righteousness and justice as the cause for which Yahweh will take up his armor once more to go out and fight as when he fights on a day of battle, which is from Zechariah. And that's what I meant by holy warrior, the ethical side to holiness, the righteousness and justice that when Yahweh planted his beloved vineyard, he expected to find growing there as, as, as sweet, tasty grapes ready for the, the wine vat. But instead, as we heard from Isaiah, the vineyard of Yahweh of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant planting. He looked for justice. He looked for mishpat. But behold, there was bloodshed. Mishpach. It's a change of basically one letter, kind of two letters, but for our purposes, just one. For righteousness, tzedakah. But behold, an outcry, tza'aka, that great wordplay. I planted this people so that I would have a harvest of the thing I love most, righteousness and justice. But I found the very opposite when I came to collect the grapes. So in keeping with his own holy character, he will judge justly and righteously according to their deeds. So will he repay wrath to his adversaries, repayment to his enemies. He will offer his enemies what his enemies refuse to offer his people. He will deal with them justly. He will look for the fruit of righteousness required by the law. And because it was all there as a testimony against them, it will only aggravate their agony on the day of the Lord. And in a way now we are brought back to where we began, that Yahweh's name 
His glory will reach to the ends of the earth. So they shall fear the name of the Lord from the west. That the whole world through his servant may know the name of the Lord. I have to think verse 19 intentionally recalls the servant who will not grow faint or be discouraged until he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands wait for his law. Is it too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel, God said to him? I will make you as a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Ironically, of course, this was Israel's original mission. But their failure meant that continually, all day long, my name is despised. So Yahweh, Yahweh's new servant will succeed where his first servant failed. But those who refuse him, those who refuse the servant, must face the same terror as those who are trapped in a body during a sudden rainstorm. You've probably heard that. I think I've mentioned it in the past that in the land there are these things called vadis. Um, and they look like Rivers used to be there, but everything is dry and the earth is crusted over. Um, so you walk in them. They're easy to walk in and through. But you have to remember that if there is a sudden rainstorm and they do come suddenly and fiercely in certain parts of the country, the rain has nowhere to go in the body because it's so hard and crusted over, so it just becomes a flood. And it comes rushing down with force and catches people unawares and destroys them. It's the imagery, actually, that Jesus has in mind when he talks about how you build your house, whether on a rock or on the sand. Yahweh is a holy warrior. And this is the way he will unleash his wrath fiercely, quickly, when no one is expecting it. But for us, there is safety. There is safety from this flood. And it's found in the one who, sitting on a white horse, is called faithful and true who judges and makes war and righteousness for those who hear his words and do them. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have taken into account not only our limitations, but also our hearts and our imaginations, so that as you make yourself known to us, you do so in ways that are familiar to us in our world. Ways that appeal to not just our minds, but to our emotions, so that we may imagine you coming to the rescue, frustrated with the impossibility of human sinfulness and a, and a resolution to it and taking it upon yourself to mount a rescue effort, to take into your own hands our cause, our plight, and to rescue us, coming not only to save, but to judge those who are our enemies, even the most notorious invisible enemies who are arrayed against us. We thank you that Christ Jesus has come and he has disarmed the principalities and authorities, that he has come, as it were, riding, riding on a white horse with a sword, with a sword of vengeance to rescue his bride. We thank you, our Father, that this is 
accomplished in righteousness and for a righteous cause. And that as we lift up our hearts and our eyes and anticipate the coming of our Lord Jesus, we might see him as a warrior coming to the rescue of his people. Our Father, we thank you that you meet with us in our limitations and in our humanity whenever we come to the table. So that in the simple, ordinary activities of eating and drinking, we may, as it were, sit at table with the Lord Jesus himself and have the kind of fellowship that friends and family have over the meal. It is a modest meal that represents the modesty of the church in its present stage, even as we wait for the glorious appearing of our Savior at the end of the age. But it's a place where you minister to us powerfully through your Holy Spirit, taking the bread, taking the wine, and communicating it to us in the Spirit as the body and blood of Jesus Christ our Lord. So visit us now, we pray, as we commune together. Bless us, we pray, through the means of grace which you yourself has established. And we ask this through Christ. Amen. I'm often taken by those images in Holy Scripture where God reveals himself in ways that are, on the one hand, obviously divine, for it is God who is revealing himself, but in other ways are mundane, familiar, the kinds of things that appeal to us in ordinary life together. And so, when we imagine God in the right way, we can imagine him as a shepherd, a title that Jesus takes over from Yahweh in John chapter 10. When we imagine God, we can imagine him as a husband. It almost sounds a little bit dangerous to do that, but this is an image that, of course, Jesus takes over from Yahweh in Ephesians 5, for instance, or Revelation 19. We can imagine God in ways that all the other gods of the ancient world would never have permitted. It was as if they were on a stage behaving and performing for their audience, while the living and the true God comes to us and reveals himself in the very things that he created for our benefit, including a God who fights for us, who realizes that we've come to the end of ourselves and our own striving and takes up our cause for himself, which of course, when it's revealed to us fully in Jesus Christ, is a warrior sacrifice so beyond imagination that it almost warrants the divine uh, inspiration that is behind it. And so it is here every time we come to the Lord's table. There are ways of administering the Lord's table that have kind of a, a religious polish to them, maybe a sacred cup filled with wine, or maybe a white disc that only those who are ordained to the ministry are allowed to touch, totally separating it from how ordinary the Last Supper was, the meal that Jesus wants us to recall whenever we sit down together. 
Instead, there, there was a table. There was bread on it. There was wine in a cup. And his friends were all around as he took up the bread, took up the cup, distributed them to his friends, and said, as we eat together, this is the meal that commemorates the new covenant. This isn't necessarily the very best way to remember the new covenant or the death of Jesus, but it does have the bread and it does have the wine and we do have a table and it's all very plain and ordinary. And so the Lord Jesus says, come and sit at the table with me and we'll rehearse once more that night on which I was betrayed when I gave my body and my blood for you so that your sins could be forgiven and your security could be established in the new covenant. And so it is. So, brothers and sisters, as we sit together for the family meal, let's remember our Lord Jesus and how he came to us in such a familiar form and carried out such a familiar task as hosting a meal. For he's done all of this because he looked and there was not a man in the world who could take up the cause or intercede for his people. And so he's taken upon himself to save us. If you are not a Christian this morning, then please don't come to this table. This is the table where the Lord meets with those who have called upon his name and who have entered into his family through faith. But to all the rest of you, I say, let's remember how the Lord looked down with pity, took up our cause, and presented himself for us so that we might be brought back to him, so that we might know his glorious name. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the same night in which he was betrayed, having taken bread and blessed and broken it, gave it to his disciples, as I, ministering in his name, give this bread to you, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. Our Savior also took the cup, and having given thanks, as has been done in his name. He gave it to his disciples, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. All of you, drink it. If you would like to participate in the offering this morning, the offering plate is on the kitchen counter. Otherwise, let's stand and sing our doxology.